Hey Biochemians, so this is Jason Matthew from Trinidad and Tobago and welcome to the Biochem GM YouTube channel. So today we're going to be trying something new, it's called Biochem in 10 minutes or less. So as the name implies, I have 10 minutes to tell you about a topic. So obviously I will not be going in a whole set of details. If you want the details on the topic, go to the YouTube channel, you know, and they're going to have videos there that are much longer and much in depth. Alright, today is just to give you a, a quick dose of a certain topic so today we're going to be looking at gluconeogenesis so get your watches out and let's begin what well, the key concepts of gluconeogenesis all right now it occurs in a fasting state and in the fasting state blood glucose levels will be low now that's a problem for certain cells the brain and the erythrocytes they depend on glucose exclusive well solely or predominantly as a source of energy all right, the brain will prefer to use glucose as a source of fuel, except in um, severe cases such as prolonged fasting and during starvation. Well, then it will use something called ketone bodies. So that's in lipid metabolism. If you want to learn more about ketone bodies, but the erythrocytes they have no choice. They must have glucose as their source of as their fuel. All right, because in erythrocytes there are no organelles and such. They solely depend on glycolysis so when you are in a fasting state and blood glucose levels are dropping that's a problem but the good news for us is that we have a pathway called gluconeogenesis which converts non-carbohydrate precursors to glucose all right so you can say the job of gluconeogenesis is to maintain blood glucose levels during the um during fasting all right so good stuff happening there Alright, so gluconeogenesis is basically when you're converting pyruvate to glucose. It is not the exact reversal of glycolysis that was discussed in other videos. Alright, and you know I said non-carbohydrate precursors. You need to learn the three common ones. First one is lactate. And you get lactate from erythrocytes. You get lactate from exercising muscle. When, you have, when you're under vigorous exercise, there's not enough oxygen reaching the muscle. The muscle is going to convert pyruvate to lactate. Lactate is a glucogenic precursor. Another one will be glycerol. Now, How do you get glycerol? Well, as you see there, glycerol from adipose tissue. What is stored in adipose tissue? Correct, fat. Fat will be like triacylglycerides. All right. Now, triacylglycerides, when you metabolize triacylglycerides, you get two things. You get glycerol and you get fatty acids. Well, the glycerol is used as to make glucose it's a glucogenic precursor all right all right so you're seeing the TCS cycle you might be wondering what does that have to do with gluconeogenesis well soon but first of all let's address one thing this is a common multiple choice question in the exam and it all has to do with acetyl-CoA and the question here is is acetyl-CoA a glucogenic precursor well that depends all right for animals the answer is no acetyl-CoA is not a glucogenic precursor for animals but for plants and microorganisms the answer is yes all right acetyl-CoA can be used as a glucogenic precursor in plants and certain microorganisms and that's because they have some extra enzymes that do another pathway called the glyoxylate pathway all right so they have that happening in, in them all right because I'll give you a little hint I won't go into details now but it all has to depend with making more oxaloacetate. Alright, so you can look, look up more about that. Alright, so let's go back to the TCA cycle and why put up the TCA cycle. Well, that has to do with the third common glucogenic precursor. So let's, let's recap. So far we have lactate, the other one is glycerol, and the third one is glucogenic amino acids. So glucogenic amino acids will give rise to glucose when they are metabolized. Now, what are glucogenic amino acids? Well, any amino acid that you can break them down and give you an intermediate of the TCA cycle, which will then eventually give you oxaloacetate, will be termed glucogenic amino acid. Also, some glucogenic amino acids, when you break them, when you cat catabolize them, you can get pyruvate. That, those are also glucogenic amino acids. So, let's look at the there are 20 common amino acids that are required in the body. All right, and the good news is, is that 18 of them are glucogenic, some of them being glucogenic and ketogenic. Now, there are two amino acids, out of that 20, 
that are solely exclusively ketogenic they do not give rise to glucose when metabolized and those two amino acids are the ones that I want you to remember and it's the two L's leucine and lysine so remember all of the 20 common amino acids only two of them cannot give rise to glucose they are exclusively uh, ketogenic and they are called leucine and lysine the other 18 are glucogenic some of them as I said they are both glucogenic and ketogenic all right but leucine and lysine are entirely solely uh, ketogenic right so these um, glucogenic amino acids right that break down into TCA intermediates they will finally give rise to oxaloacetate and that oxaloacetate will go back in the liver oh by the way I don't think I mentioned this as yet but gluconeogenesis takes place predominantly in the liver all right so let's do some more recapping here well the point here as I was saying before most of your gluconeogenesis will take place in your liver 90% of it now as the fasting continues and there's prolonged fasting well then the kidney starts to help out a little so a little of the gluconeogenesis takes place in the kidney kidney but the significant or the, and the most amount of gluconeogenesis takes place in the liver all right so for two moles of pyruvate you get one mole of glucose and gluconeogenesis that is a very energetically costly process it requires 4 ATP, 2 GTP, and 2 NADH. So remember that, right? This process where you convert in 2 moles of pyruvate to 1 mole of glucose requires 4 ATPs, 2 GTPs, and 2 NADH. So let's remember that. Alright, now unlike glycolysis, glycolysis, all the enzymes are in the cytosol. Well, gluconeogenesis is slightly different. All right, you have enzymes in the mitochondria as well as enzymes in the cytosol. In fact, the first bypass reaction when you start gluconeogenesis, that takes place in the mitochondria and then it finishes off in the cytosol. So it has both cytosolic as well as mitochondrial enzymes for gluconeogenesis. There are three bypass reactions and those three bypass reactions require four enzymes. All right, and the bypass reactions are well, pyruvic carboxylase and PEPCK. PEPCK standing for phosphine or pyruvic carboxykinase. All right, you have the second one, which is fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. And finally, glucose 6-phosphatase. Now, my challenge to you is to tell me what enzymes in glycolysis these enzymes in gluconeogenesis are bypassing. All right, so check that out. Now, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis are reciprocally regulated. Now, what does that mean? It means that when one is on, the other is off. So, when glycolysis is on, gluconeogenesis is switched off. When gluconeogenesis is on, glycolysis is switched off. And that is um, controlled via hormone regulation as well as allosteric um, control and so on. And we're going to be doing a lot of this when we look at integration of metabolism and we start looking at regulation and so on. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase is the most important regulatory enzyme. Just like how PFK1 was the most important regulatory enzyme in glycolysis, well, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase is the most important regulatory enzyme in gluconeogenesis. And finally, remember I told you before that gluconeogenesis is a very energetically costly process. Well, how do we get this energy? Well, we have increased fatty acid oxidation in the liver. And when we break down fatty acids, we get acetyl-CoA. Right? And, um, and that acetyl-CoA stimulates pyruvic carbo carboxylase. So you see where beta oxidation has a link with gluconeogenesis. And that, that makes sense. You have these things taking place in a fasting state. And we'll get more details when we look at integration of metabolism. All right, so this is the big overview. All right, as I said, it's short and sweet, less than 10 minutes. If you want more details, go to the other videos on the Barak MGM YouTube channel. All right, we always want to hear 
you know you're looking at more videos and, and please read your textbooks read your journal articles and just keep reading all right and learning is, is excellent stuff so we have reached the end i hope i st i stayed in the within the 10 minutes i wasn't timing myself uh you tell me all right if this video was helpful to you please like the video if you haven't subscribed as yet please become a biochemian subscribe to the biochem gm youtube channel and as usual send your comments we would love to hear from you tell us which country you're from um, how is this helping you understand biochemistry? We love to hear from you guys. And you know, thank you for all your support. And guys, more videos coming soon. Take care. Bye bye.